We are live. Very good. <laughs> okay, so we can start promptly at three o'clock. Uh, I'll just introduce the session. Um, I'm Ian Rotherham, uh, and I'm not the person who's down on your list as chairing the session. I'm not Joanne. Uh, she's being whisked away for more important things, I gather. So I'm chairing the session, and I'd like to welcome you all to a really interesting uh, series of talks this afternoon. The first uh, is on the theme of species interactions, and we have a, a rich diversity of presentations. The first is by Jason Griffiths on linking trait change with species population dynamics, improves ecological predictability and understanding. So, Jason. Okay, so today I'm going to kind of explain to you how we can uh, link together uh, changes in traits of the population, such as mean body size, for example, uh, with the temporal patterns of changes in species abundance, multiple species perhaps, uh, and how this can help us to improve the predictions of the community's dynamics and generate some new insights into the mechanisms that are going on. So first thing to, no to notice is that uh, species interactions can often be trait dependent. So if a prey uh, develops thorns or modifies its behavior to become more camouflaged, this can influence the strength of predator-prey interactions, for example. Conversely, um, if densities are altered, this can affect the selection pressures, uh, driving changes in the traits themselves. So here are a couple of examples where changes in predator density will affect the size of fish, for example, or the uh, armament of daphnids. If you have both of these processes operating at the same time, you can get a sort of feedback, uh, a trait abundance feedback, uh, where trait changes influence the species interactions, affecting density, and feeding back to affect the traits themselves. And this uh, trait abundance feedbacks makes possible a wide range of theoretical uh, patterns in communities and in the traits that they have, uh, which has been explored theoretically, but a lot of work is needed to um, show how this actually plays out in real ecological systems. And so what we want to do in the, this work is to assess whether we can actually measure some of these things. And we start off with an empirical system in the lab, and we want to know if we can detect traits which modify species interactions. Also, if we can detect which species densities are affecting trait change. So that's the reverse arrow. And then we also want to know if including these trait abundance feedbacks can help us improve our prediction of community dynamics, so be actually useful. And if we can get new biological insight by doing this. So what do we actually do? Well, we set up um, an experimental system to generate this data. Uh, it's a predator-prey -prey resource system where we have a bacterial resource, uh, a prey of protists which feed on the bacteria, and a larger predatory protist which feeds both on the prey and the resource. This generates intraguild predation. We also note that there's an element of the resource composition which is changing over time which we have to incorporate into our models. Um, and so now we allow this uh, populations which have been set up uh, to grow and we monitor them over a period of time. And we measure not only the abundances in these different populations, but also a range of traits, uh, both body size, uh, sorry, morphological traits, such as body size, length, width, and area. But we also uh, take behavioral measurements by uh, taking videos and using automated recognition software to uh, generate trajectories and taking summaries of those about average speeds, the frequencies which individuals are moving around and turning in the environment, and also how variable their speeds are to get some idea of how they explore the environment. And so this generates time series of the abundance dynamics of the prey to prey and the resource and also the, all these different traits. And so what we want to do is to link these uh, using some kind of novel uh, approach. And so the approach that we do is to take a classical uh, framework for modeling uh, 
intraguild predation. Uh, this is the Holton Polis model. Uh, we discretize this model, and because it makes strong assumptions about how species interact, namely, often there's type two functional response or type one type functional response. So, increase in resource density, uh, the uh, consumers increase the consumption with a very specific uh, form. What we want to do is relax that assumption and allow the data to speak for itself. And so the way that we do this is to use sort of smooth uh, functional relationships. So this, will, this curve can then be inferred from the data and could take whichever shape the data uh, suggests. And then we incorporate trait changes by adding another axis. So now the consumption, which are the arrows, depends on both the, uh, the density of the prey that's being consumed and also the values of the prey, uh, the values of the traits, sorry. So we have a sort of two-dimensional smooth surface that describes predation as it depends on availability and on traits. And so what we, want, what we want to do is determine uh, how well we can explain these dynamics using this model. And so after we parameterize this model, we find that the species abundances can be well captured. We can, so on the left here, we have the resource dynamics. On the middle, we have prey dynamics. And on the far side, the predator dynamics. The, the dots are the data, so the six replicate popula populations. Uh, the black line is the predictions of the model, uh, the mean predictions, and the shaded regions are the range of predictions which our model uh, makes. And so you can see that it captures the dynamics well. And the important question here is um, how much is our predictability, um, our ability to make predictions improved by adding in these traits? So we, what we have to do is compare the, the, these models with a baseline model. So that's effectively the model without any trait information in it. So that's this first column. And what you see on the y-axis is the prediction error. So this is how well we can um, estimate dynamics of a population which we left out. So we use leave one out um, cross-validation. We leave one uh, replicate population out. We fit the data. We see how well it does and we cycle through leaving each out sequentially, and we get a score. You'll see there are two bars. This is when we incorporate the resource composition in the um, blue, um, or if not, in the red. And so under this baseline scenario, uh, they're quite similar. And so then we can ask how much um, we can improve our ability to predict population dynamics by adding in the trait information. And we can see that area does a really great job of improving our predictability, which is, so this is a 16% improvement in our predictive ability to describe the dynamics. And because this is using leave one out um, cross validation, this is actually uh, saying it's a, a good improvement in our ability to predict novel dynamics. Um, we can also see that it's a kind of interaction, so you need to have both the resource composition information in there as well as the trait information. But importantly, uh, the area of uh, the prey population is very important in describing how the dynamics of these populations are changing over time. We also see that when we look at the other um, traits, there's some, some improvements, but nothing that's as great. So from this, we conclude that looking at uh, including tr uh, prey trait area into our models is very important. And so we can then go on and look at um, how does this inclusion help us make uh, better predictions? How does it actually affect the dynamics? So when we evaluate the model, we see that prey area, which decreases over time, um, is it associated with a, a reduction in the, um, the rate with, with which it consumes resources. Sorry, the rate with which it is consumed. So it is predated much less over time as it decreases in body size. So on the figure on the other side, you see that as the color goes from uh, the blues down to the reds, there is a reduction in consumption rate. At the same time, 
when the prey is reducing its body size, it is also decreasing the rate with which it is consuming resources itself. So it's feeding more slowly when it's uh, of smaller sizes. And um, again, we can see this on the plot with a, as the colors go from blues to reds, the feeding rate is decreased. So this is a decrease in both the rate with which it's consuming resources and the rate with which uh, it is being predated. So from this, we can detect uh, a growth defense trade-off in the life history strategy. So over time, it is taking a, um, a new life history strategy with which it becomes more defended, but it's kind of less able to uh, consume resources itself. Uh, which is an important um, thing to have learned in this system because it wasn't really realized previously. And so we then we want to know how does this um, change in prey area, how is it driven by changes in the composition of the uh, community? And so on the left hand side here we see uh, the change in the prey area and on the y-axis we have um, the prey density and this shows that with an increase in uh, competitive density, so uh, pre the prey themselves, this drives a reduction in body size. So there's a competition related reduction in body size. And at the same time, there's also a component of this prey size reduction, which is related to the density of pr uh, predators in the environment. So there's dually um, a effect of the predators and the prey themselves that is driving uh, selection for a smaller body size over time. So what can we conclude from this um, work and this modeling approach? Well, we've been able to reveal uh, a rich network of relationships and trait abundance feedbacks. We've shown that uh, the prey area body size is affecting the interactions between the resource and the prey and the prey and the predator. We've also shown that the predator and the prey densities are affecting the prey body size. And so there's multiple feedback loops which are occurring here in the system and driving the sort of intricate dynamics that we see. Um, so we've, at the same time, been able to unveil some important inf uh, inferences about what biological mechanisms are involved here. And as it appears that uh, growth defense trade-off is very important, it seems that we need to look much more in depth into uh, how these defensive uh, abilities or abilities to reduce predation are uh, driven. So with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge all the people involved in this project. Dylan Charles, Frank Pennekamp, who developed the software for monitoring, and Owen Petchy. And thank you all very much. OK, we do have time for questions. Gentleman there? A lady? Oh. Lady? Hi, uh, Sophie Smout from St. Andrews. Um, quick question, uh, is the uh, predation on the larger sizes of prey yep. uh, uh, to do with detectability of the prey or are the prey preferred because they're bigger and tastier? Yeah, so there isn't actually any evidence that it's size selective in that way and it's potentially, we, we don't have like a certainty on either of these. But it could also be that it's just a selection for a life history where they uh, reproduce more quickly at a smaller body size. And it could be a, perhaps a combination of the two. So your predator is fishing down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? No. Okay, you've silenced them. Thank you yeah, very much. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to our second presentation. This is Ruben Diaz Sierra on symmetry and standardization in a new family of indices for measuring the intensity and importance of plant and neighborhood neighbor effects. Yeah. Ruben. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to present the work, uh, collaboration between physicists and ecologists. We'll try to do like um, a mathematical, a serious analysis, but also keeping 
the ecological meaning and understanding the, the indices we analyze. For those of you who does, was not in the field, I haven't seen many people working in facilitation in the, in the conference, but this is quite a hot topic. And you know, at the beginning, like a competition was the, key, the queen of the interactions. So always about competition, but then positive interaction were discovered and seems to be quite relevant and very well studied. For example, the stress gradient hypothesis has been uh, well studied also. And for to understand this uh, the evolution, well, the, the traits of the effect of interactions along with uh, gradients, we need indices. And, uh, these are two very well-known papers in the in the field about intensity and importance. Okay, so what, I, what I'm going to do in the talk is review the pitfalls of previous intensity and importance indices for these uh, neighbor interactions based on two properties of the indices. First one is standardization, which deals with uh, comparing experiments from plants for plants with different size, as simple as that. And we learned that previous importance indices are not standardized. And the second one is uh, symmetry. So we had the, like the old queen of uh, uh, competition. And now the, she knows that the facilitation is up there. And she wants to know how important is this facilitation. Is this is prettier than me? Is more relevant than me? So he asked in the, in the mirror, the magic mirror, and wonders, what's this facilitation? And OK, for that, we need to measure in, in the same balance, competition and facilitation. And this is symmetry. That's what we call symmetry of uh, competition and facilitation. And we now know that this was not really well understood, defined or applied for this type of indices. It was out there, but not like uh, completely understood. Uh, we, we propose a solution, a new index, a new family of indices. So to further uh, put into context, we have a, like plenty of experiments, a very complex situation of, a, of a field work with different plants, different stress, stressors, different outcomes of the neighbor interactions. And we want to put all this information into one index or many indices, but one scale that goes from a negative value for competition to a positive value for facilitation summarizing all this information. Uh, well, just want you to understand this picture of the big tree. Yes, that's what they do, what is done in this field of comparing uh, neighbor effects. So we have the, the tree growing alone. So we have a certain biomass or performance, and also the tree growing with a certain uh, neighbor uh, with a different biomass, and we compare both values. That's what indices more or less does. Do. So I'm going to talk about two indices, intensity and importance. There are other indices. I don't think that these are necessarily the best for all experiments, but they are quite popular. They're being used a lot and not very well understand sometimes. And well, first, the intensity is very simple. It's just to have the, the plant, the focus plant, and the focal plant, and the alone and with a competitor, and the difference is the intensity of the interaction, of the effect. You can, of course, normalize it or standardize it, but more or less that's the, what it measures. And importance, want to put, wants to put that into the context of other impacts of, on the plant. So we have a, the same situation here, a decrease of six units because of the neighbor, but also we compare it to the optimal case, the maximum performance. And we want to put in, rela in relation this decrease due to neighbors and the decrease due to all the impact. OK, so first property, standardization. I've said already, it allows comparison of different target species. Now you put a small grass and a tree, very different size. But previous important indices, this e-importance from SAFAN, uh, 
What they do is, it, okay, they compare the red quantity, the difference in performance due to neighbors, to the sum of the two, uh, these two quantities. So this is the same with for a small plant for a big tree. So the, index, the index gives the same value. This is quite obvious when you put it that way, but it was not so obvious at the beginning. So this index doesn't take into account the size of the, your focal plant, so you need to change that. And second property is the symmetry that as I told you allows comparison of competition and facilitation. So we have the evil queen waiting to know if this competition of eight units, what, uh, what means that for facilitation? And of course, the, the most intuitive uh, answer will be, okay, if, if competition reduces eight units, facilitation has to add eight units to be symmetric. So it will say that these two effects are the same. Well, that at least I think is some uh, field ecologists tend to think about the symmetric of interaction of the effect of interactions, but there are no additive indices for intensity. There are additive indices for importance, but they are not normalized, so it doesn't work either. But there was symmet symmetric indices for intensity. What symmetry they had? is the commutative symmetry. It's not additive, it's more kind of multiplicative. This is not very precise, but it works for the talk. So if we go from 10 to two, we are dividing by five. So commutative symmetry for intensity multiplies by five. So it goes from 10 to 50 in biomass. So what we see is that this symmetry, which has sense, of course, but it's comparing an increasing two, an decreasing eight with an increasing 40. That could make the queen very happy, knowing that this, this Snow White needs to be 40 times prettier than her to be comparable. But that's how, how it's done. And it has sense for certain cases. So what's our proposal with that? Oh, and this, there are these examples for commutative indices, RII, which is quite famous and is is very used in the studies of stage variant hypothesis, uh, for example, or a, a relative neighbor effect also. Okay, so that's our proposal. We build a new family of indices from a single formula, where in fact what we, what we are doing is putting this red quantity here up and down in, in the numerator and denominator, which guarantees symmetry. It's not so easy to explain, but if you do some graphs, it's, it's easier. And we, we choose different uh, reference for the denominator also. And then we build intensity, importance, with additive and commutative symmetry. Have these four indices, which are very easy to, to implement. Okay, and just an example of the effect of these uh, new indices. I go for uh, how symmetry affects the comparison of facilitative and competitive effects, and taking values from Montes et al, who had pairwise interaction between Mediterranean plants. We had this example of this plant. We choose 100 just to do it easier for the biomass of the plant alone. And then with a the facilitator, there is an increment in 97 uh, units of biomass. With a the competitor, there's a decrease of 77. So, okay, if we compare the, the absolute effect, these values, we say facilitation has, a, this facilitator has a bigger effect than this competitor. When they compare. And that's what our additive index, this new neighbor int intensity additive index does, keeps the, the same comparison. But if we go for all commutative indices, like RII, we have the opposite. For, a, for this index, this competition is twice as relevant as the facilitation. So this, quite of, this is not very intuitive so for a lot of cases. Because what they are waiting, this commutative, this commutative index is putting the value, the values in reference to the sum of 
of the biomasses. So for facilitation, the reference is much bigger, and for competition, it's smaller. So that's what produces the, this imbalance in, in comparisons. Uh, okay, so as final conclusions, these new neighbor effect indices family produce four indices that have a common formulation. So we can have all of the indices together and then compare them without expecting any problem coming from the definition itself. There are no unbiased, spurious uh, effects coming from, from the definition of the index. So that's quite useful, we hope. And also, these indices are all standardized, which is the first time for importance. And also, as a side effect, this solves some statistical problems that were due to not being standardized. They were showing these certain trends that were difficult to explain, and now these indices don't, don't have that. And finally, we have like a more better understanding of additive and commutative symmetries, the comparison of these two effects. So you, if, when you are, have to analyze data from the field, you need to be sure of what, are, what do you want to do with your symmetry if you are comparing, of course, uh, competition and facilitation, if not, it's not, not, not important. And first, with, we advise to look at additive symmetry, which seems to be more intuitive. If, if it's not for you, then you, you can do another thing, but consider it, because if not, you are, have the risk of underestimating facilitation. Uh, well, that's it. I thank you, my colleagues. Uh, well, and that's a publication we have been, we had accepted recently in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. So, thanks for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. Um, sorry if I missed this, but um, are these indices applied to the raw data or to log transformed data at any stage? Um, log transform? That's a <laughs> tricky question. <laughs> In fact, because log is somehow like multiplicative transformation. So, no, we think if you are going to do that, then you just go for multiplicative, for commutative symmetry with the raw data. But no, I haven't tried to compare log because for biomasses it's not very common to do that, so I haven't done that. Thanks. Question here. Thanks. Uh, I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate on why is it important to separate the impact of the neighbors to whether they're creating a structural environment or it's a direct competition effect? Well, it is not my work, but <laughs> okay. importance was defined because okay, intensity is also a bit tricky because if, especially if you have obligate facilitation, so plant alone cannot survive, but you put a neighbor and then it, it can grow. So then immediately the intensity index goes to the maximum level. So even if you, like, you have nothing with species alone, but a little bit with a, a facilitator, you get a really large value. So what they wanted to put is that in comparison of what are all the effects on the plant, how important is the, the, neighbor, effect, the, the neighbor effect? Because if you just compare in isolated cases, you can get large or very large or very small values without the context of, for the plant. So it's, there are some papers defending it, some papers against it, so it's quite a controversial uh, measurement. Okay, any final questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, our next speaker is Monique Smith, who will talk about the Galadriel's gift, soil legacies in grassland restoration. Hi everyone, 
I'm here to give you an Australian perspective of soil legacies in grassland restoration. So I'm from Adelaide on the south coast of Australia. We have a lovely Mediterranean climate with relatively low rainfall and we have um, infertile soil. So our native plants are well adapted to low nutrient environments. It's also a heavily cleared landscape. Uh, this is mostly due to agriculture. So I'm interested in how soil microbes may affect grassland restoration. So I think we all know that um, soil microbes are important for um, plant growth. They can be um, pathogenic or have um, you know, symbiotic relationships that help plants grow. So because of this, soil microbes can control plant species composition. But in addition, um, microbial communities are often altered in degraded areas. So one way is when you have um, exotic species invading, they offer different organic matter, root exudates, and they have different root structures. So they can support different microbial communities. In addition, depending on the land use, that can also affect the microbial communities. So um, in my case, farming practices such as the addition of fertilizer and tilling can affect the microbial community. And that can then therefore affect that relationship. So I'm looking, um, well my field site is an old field, so old fields um, have been cleared for agriculture, so no native species remain, um, not even in the seed bank anymore. They're highly modified systems um, because of the farming practices such as tilling and adding fertiliser, and um, fertiliser is a big problem, this can retain, in, um, high nutrients can retain in the soil for a long time. And once farming ceases, they become overrun with invasive species. So I've got a couple of examples here that you might be familiar with because they're European species, but a big pest for us in Australia. And they're the dominant species at my field site as well. But the main thing with old fields is that they're so severely modified that they've crossed ecological thresholds. So they're not going to return back to the state that they were once in um, through succession. They're going to need active restoration um, to do that. So I'm interested in what role soil microbes play in reinforcing this degraded state and preventing them in, to returning back to a native state. I'm also interested in are the ch changes to the microbial communities too great to support native plants when we do go in and um, start restoring these systems. So one system that's been um, heavily cleared, uh, native grasslands or open grassy woodlands, so any system that's grass dominated, that's because they're very suitable for agriculture and also pretty easy to clear. So only uh, small remnant patches now remain, and these are often degraded and become overrun with weeds. There are also um, important habitats and feeding grounds. So I have some pretty cute examples. So we've got a baby kangaroo and a baby wombat. Just <laughs> um, as two examples of things that feed on grass, but of course there's lizards and birds and other things as well. But native grasses are important for um, ecosystem services as well. So, yeah, very important to bring them back. So this brings me to my research questions. I um, was asking, do remnant microbial communities benefit native grass growth and establishment? And do invasive grasses benefit from microbial communities in an old field? So to do this, I have bought some sandy loam and I sterilized that via autoclaving and I set some aside as the control. And then the rest I use for bulk soil for my two treatments. And to that bulk soil, I added field collected soil from an old field, so the area that's been overrun with weeds. And um, also field soil from a remnant area that uh, was a um, na native grassland. And within those three treatments, I grew um, an invasive annual grass and two native perennial grasses. And these native perennials were once common in the area and um, are now commonly used in restoration. I don't expect you to know them. <laughs> so I'm going to present my results as microbial gro growth response of the plants. So this is the biomass of plants grown with the inoculant 
take the mean biomass of plants that had no microbes in the sterile control, and then you divide that by the mean biomass in, uh, again with the sterile control. So it's represented as a percentage. So you can see that on this graph, I have microbial growth response on the Y, and across the line where I've got zero would indicate that there's been um, no growth response in the plant um, with the addition of microbes. Above the line is a positive growth response, and then again below the line is a negative growth response. And what you can see here on um, the left of the graph is the response of the weed species and had a positive growth response with both old field microbes and remnant microbes. The um, native species there, Ostrostypha, had a negative growth response with old field microbes, but a positive growth response when um, grown with remnant microbes. Now, the other native species had very little growth in the control. So there appears to be some sort of reliance on um, soil microbes for their growth. And the, when with remnant microbes, maybe a slightly um, increased growth. So just a quick halfway summary of that experiment. The results uh, indicated to us that the degraded state in the old field may be reinforced by this negative growth response in um, the native species or a weaker response in one of the species. But there's minimal effect on the invasive, so it must be taking advantage of this um, sort of negative effect on the native species, but the invasive species aren't fussy. So this made us think that remnant soil may be the gift of Gladriel for restoration. And if you don't know what I mean, do yourself a favour and read the Lord of the Rings books. <laughs> but basically, soil from Galadriel's orchard helped restore the Shire at the end of the, the book. But in our case, we're thinking remnant soil microbes um, can maybe help um, our native grasses because they've been increasing their growth and make them more competitive and probably re reproduce more. So we thought, great. <laughs> but what about the soil nutrient legacies? Will we see the same um, effects from the microbes when we take this into account? But also, are the microbial communities different, like we think, between the old field and remnant areas? But more importantly, do they change after being exposed to invasive plant species or native plant species? So the main difference in this experiment was the bulk soil that I used. Instead of the commercial sandy loam, I took bulk soil from the field. So I've got the remnant area again and the old field area again to take into account the soil legacies, but I kept them um, sterilized. But the main difference there is the nutrients in the soil. So I've just got two examples where um, the old field has uh, doubled the amount of phosphorus and potassium than the remnant area, but that's... Um, you know, one example of many, or two examples of many. Um, so to that sterile bulk soil, I added the microbes again by a field collected soil. So again, the old field and remnant soil. And so there's, um, I guess, four treatments here, and each of those ha had a corresponding control. So I added sterile soil as well to the bulk soil. I used the native species from the first experiment that had very little growth with the control, so it had a, a, a large microbial growth response. And I changed the weed species to be the more dominant at my field site, but expecting a similar response. So this graph is set up in the same way, but I've split the um, invasive and native species, and I have the bulk soil here on the X. So that, again, is the, um, I guess, more to do with the nutrients in the soil for the bulk soil, and the inoculant is more about the microbes that were added. So what we found was that the microbes affect the plants more positively when they've been added to their soil of origin. So this is regardless of what plant species we're talking about, but um, I'm highlighting it in the native um, because that's where the, I guess, the response was the most obvious. So here we have remnant microbes in remnant bulk soil um, producing a positive growth response. And old field microbes in old field bulk soil, um, again, producing a positive growth response. I also found that native plants had a more positive growth response um, than the invasive plants when in remnant bulk soil. So this is regardless of what microbes were added. Um, 
But yeah, you can see here that quite clearly there's a negative growth response in the weed when in um, the remnant bulk soil. But importantly, there was no clear benefit of adding remnant microbes to the old field soil for the um, native species, which is what we wanted for restoration. So to look at the microbial communities, I used a metabarcoding approach to identify the um, operational taxonomic units, or OTUs. And I'm going to present to you the uh, Permanova results of uh, presence, absence of um, the OTUs. And I found there was a significant three-way interaction between the bulk soil used, the inoculant added, and which plant species the microbes were um, exposed to. So that was significant for fungi and bacteria, but I'm just going to present bacteria because it had the strongest response. So you can see here, um, this is an MDS plot. Uh, so the points closer together, more similar in the bacterial species present. And the most striking difference is that the um, old field um, yeah, old field inoculant in triangles and the remnant inoculant in circles are, are clearly quite different. But what we thought was really interesting is that these, the bacterial communities began to differ between the grass species. So in blue is the, um, when exposed to the invasive species and in the, I don't know, orange color is when exposed to the native species. And you can see that the bacterial communities are starting to separate after four months in this glasshouse experiment. Now you may remember I said it was a three-way interaction, so bulk soil also influenced the bacterial OTUs present, um, as we'd expect given the um, difference in nutrients. So this is the same MDS, but I've just put different labels on because it gets very complicated if you put three-way in one graph. Um, but these samples here were um, before the plants were added, so uh, this is after two weeks of incubation. The microbial communities are beginning to separate there, so they're responding very quickly to the chain differences in um, nutrients between the bulk soil. So, what have we learnt? Um, so, soil microbes and soil nutrient legacies interact and they change the microbial growth response of the plants. So, by increasing the nutrients in the second experiment, this reduced the reliance um, on microbes for the native species. The soil origin had an effect on the microbe plant interactions, so adding microbes to their um, soil of origin increased the growth of the plants. But also, adding remnant microbes to the old field soil had no clear benefit, so not the answer for restoration, maybe. Native and invasive grasses also altered the microbial communities differently, so this could be how invasive species maintain dominance in an area. But also, if the native species are doing this, maybe we don't need to inoculate in restoration as they may be able to attract the microbes that they need. But I think the major finding um, was that using inoculation in restoration or incorporating soil microbes um, may not be as straightforward as elf magic, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, just have a lot of people to thank, um, a lot of people to help me with the project. Um, but also um, being able to travel here from Australia as well. And thank you all for listening. Okay, fascinating stuff. So, questions? At the front. So if, uh, if you were a land manager of some kind, uh, what would you recommend people who wanted to uh, transition back to native grasslands do? Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of potential in this, but um, I think more work needs to be done in how the soil microbes uh, interact. So I don't think we're quite at the stage of putting it into practice, um, and I think a lot of people are really keen to have presented this work at a restoration conference, so the interest is there. I just think um, particularly with Australian native species, there's not a lot going on. We don't really know what they need and what interactions they have. So I think, yeah, we'll be doing it soon, but not right now, yeah. <laughs> there was a question at the back. Hey. 
Hello. Um, so you're doing a lot of work looking at the bulk soil. I just wondered mm -hmm. if you'd be looking at, um, or you're interested in looking at the soil uh, closer to the root system for the rhizosphere, for your microbial communities mm -hmm. particularly. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I didn't for this because it was sort of the first time I've done this. Um, but looking, I've sort of been visiting a few labs on this visit and it's um, definitely where a lot of the change happens is around, yeah, around the roots. So um, again, I think maybe that would be the next step is, is working out what microbes are they actually attracting to the roots and, and a little bit more into the, I guess, symbiotic relationships um, before we go into inoculating. Um, yeah, so that's one way of doing it for sure. Yeah. Do you know if any of these species are mycorrhizal? Um, well, I mean, I've been looking at the roots, and then, the, you know, they're definitely infected. Um, and, but again, there hasn't been that much work done. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're in the roots, so, yeah. <laughs> Have you been able to see any, like, functional groups or any specific, maybe, uh, only groups which uh, have been associated with the improved not yet, um, but that's where my analysis is going to go. I just did this, um, you know, two weeks before coming here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I just looked at presence, absence differences because um, I knew how to do that. And then, the, yeah, the next step, um, definitely moving forward, is, is working out those groups and what's important for sure. Okay, thank you, Minnie. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> right, our next speaker is Eliska... I apologise for my terrible pronunciation. <laughs> and she's going to talk about questioning a negative result. The dominant species does not shape plant soil feedback on a grassland community in a long-term removal experiment. Okay, so thank you very much for introduction. Actually, it's Eliška Kudjákova. But I'll work on it. You were very close. <laughs> and thanks for coming. Uh, so today I would like to speak also about plant soil interactions as well as Monique. Uh, but uh, from the plant perspective. And uh, the first thing I learned when I was preparing the presentation was that uh, you need really to be very careful when you are inventing the title because not only it's quite long, but also there is this big spoiler that I have no surprises for you left, that uh, I have no <laughs> interesting results. But I hope you will find my presentation interesting. Uh, so uh, now I am going to tell you the story of the negative result, which I already spoiled. So it all began in the Czech Republic in uh, giant mountains uh, when uh, Professor Tomáš Herben uh, set up a removal experiment. It was done in 1994, and they were trying to uh, focus on plant soil uh, uh, plant interactions on a small scale within uh, grassland. So they set up small uh, permanent plots, half to half meter, and they were uh, trying to, because this, uh, this site is highly dominated by Festuca rubra, which is a grass species and it forms up to 30% of the total biomass on these stands. And uh, their uh, objective was to find out if they remove this dominant, how the species will uh, compensate for, for the absence of the uh, dominant species and uh, how the in interactions will change. And uh, they did a lot of work. They were removing uh, this Festuca rubra each individual every year since 1994 until 2014, but there was this gap, uh, eight year gap in the middle. Uh, but they were weeding the species out uh, every year, several times per year. So you can imagine that it was quite hard work and though I wasn't there, I found some evidences. So here you can see uh, the Professor Herben and his student uh, removing really hard. <laughs> and uh, they also published their results, but I am not going to talk about this, so just a few studies. But uh, what is important for me uh, was that uh, in 2014, they decided to end up this experiment. And because I focus on plant cell interactions, uh, for me, this was quite a great opportunity because uh, as you can imagine, it's really hard to have such a great data uh, because uh, there was this removal done for so many years and at least th there was uh, five years of uh, 
continuous removal. So there was five years at least of continuous management or continuous conditioning of the soil by the whole community with the presence of the dominant species or without it. So my question was whether uh, if I take this soil from these stands, whether I can uh, find some differences in species performance when they are grown in this soil, either uh, conditioned by, uh, uh, by community dominated with Festo Carubra or without it. So that was my uh, main question. And so I took the soil from these stands and I put it into the pots and planted four species into it. Uh, first of one was Festu carubra itself, and then uh, three other species, so Antoxantum odoratum, another grass species, and two, er two herbs, uh, Leontodon hispidus and Ranunculus acris. And I put those into climate chamber, which was simulating somehow the summer conditions in the giant mountains. And after four months, I harvested the biomass. And as you already know, I found no difference in the species performance. Uh, so here you can see the uh, data on total biomass for each of the four species. And uh, the gray bars represent uh, biomass which was grown in the soil which was previously con uh, conditioned by the Festuca dominated community. But why uh, this result? So uh, we, have, we had at least five year conditioning with, and the treatment history because it was actually weeded out for much more many years. Uh, so this is quite a long, long time of conditioning. And also uh, Festo Carubra is uh, highly abundant on these sites. You, you could have think that uh, there might be only several individuals, but it was really up to 30, uh, third, one third of the total biomass of the community. So another reason why there should be an effect and also, uh, when I was searching through the literature, I found many studies which were dealing with this species, and they found some evidences that uh, it can generate plant soil feedbacks. It can influence growth of far, uh, our other species. So I was thinking about this, and I uh, developed three hypotheses why we didn't found this, uh, why we didn't find this effect. So the first one was that maybe uh, other people did something wrong or. Uh, I don't know, we have some strange uh, genotype, genotype of, of this species. So first hypothesis was that Festu carubra does not generate plant soil feedback at all. Or maybe there is something wrong with the field soil. Uh, so maybe it does not generate this effect in uh, soil from the giant mountains. Or the last thing that uh, came to my mind was that maybe the effect of Festu carubra was covered by effects of other species which were present in the community. So I wanted to test all those hypotheses. So the first one, uh, I took soil. It was just uh, soil from close to Prague. So it was uh, more nutrient rich than the field soil from giant mountain. So I uh, mixed it with sand in one to one ratio. And to this soil, I uh, put Festu carubra plants. I grew them to condition the soil, and I uh, used unplanted control. And then I harvested these plants. So I had either uh, soil which was conditioned by Festu carubra or unplanted previously. And then I put uh, the four experimental species into this soil uh, as in the feedback phase to see how they will perform. And I did the same for the control. And here you can see the results. So here you can see that all the species responded significantly to the conditioning treatment. So all of them grew better in the control soil than in the soil which was previously conditioned by Festu carubra. So basically, we can say that Festu carubra at least does something. It does generate plant soil feedback. And how about the soil from the field? So I repeated the same uh, design, but using soil from the locality. So uh, again, I had soil which was conditioned by Festu carubra or unconditioned, and then the four species grown in, in, the, in it. And here you can see the results. So again, there was significant effect of, uh, uh, in all the species. The only exception was Ranunculus acris, uh, it's the last one, but there was only marginal uh, difference. So again, we can say that 
it works also in the soil from Kirkonoshe. So the last uh, option was that maybe there is some kind of effect of the other species. So what I did, I somehow uh, recycled this experiment. So I took the uh, soil from the feedback phase and I put it into another pot. So I, after harvesting the previous experiments, I removed the plants and used the soil again and planted uh, Festuca rubra into this soil. I did this experiment only for Festuca rubra because of uh, logistic reasons. I didn't have enough soil and so on. Uh, and my question was whether, if you uh, take a look on this uh, design, whether I can uh, detect the difference uh, in Festuca rubra growth in the feedback phase, in the third phase, uh, if I consider the first conditioning, meaning that if still the effect of the first conditioning by Festuca rubra can be detectable even after it was uh, grown by other species. Uh, so I tested this and I found almost nothing. So here you can see that um, these are data only for Festuca rubra plants. So uh, the gray bars represent uh, treatments which were uh, in the first conditioning phase grown by Festuca rubra. And then in the second conditioning by either of the uh, each of the four species. And here you can see that only in the case when in the second conditioning phase there was Ranunculus acris, uh, there was still the effect of the previous conditioning by Festuca rubra. But if, uh, so that's the only uh, difference which, which was detectable. But if we go back to the previous experiment, you can see that it was also the species which was the smallest and also there was no difference between the two treatments. So maybe it's caused by this. So to answer the third hypothesis, uh, we could say that yes, uh, the effect of Festucarebra can be covered by uh, other species effects, but unless they are uh, not too small uh, to do that. But th this would be very nice. But I also uh, did the same experiment as the previous one with the garden soil, not with the soil from the field. And I found this. So again, this is the effect of the first conditioning by Festuca rubra, which obviously is not covered by effects of the other species. So maybe it's not that simple and there's still many things to be answered. Uh, what I personally think is that uh, possibly this is driven by the effect of nutrients because this soil is much more nutrient rich. So maybe there is the effect of nutrient uptake from the first phase of conditioning. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> so there are uh, many steps I want to take more. So the first one is opening the black box. So as I suggested, I, I am going to focus on uh, soil conditions. So I, I, I was taking a soil samples during all the experiments and I, I would like to see uh, how the nutrient uh, content changed during each conditioning and how was it species specific. And I would also like to focus on microbial communities. But I also am going to do some more experimental work. So, because as you can imagine, the species interactions are not that simple that species are growing after each other, but they are interacting within one time. So I am going to do this experiment. It, it is actually now in process. And I'm uh, conditioning soil with some kind of micro communities, which are consisting of the four experimental species. Uh, one of them is usually uh, Festuca rubra, and the rest three individuals are uh, chosen uh, from the other experimental species in all combinations you can imagine. So for example, here's another individual of Festuca rubra and another Antoxantum and Ranunculus acris. So we are missing Leontodon hispidus here, but uh, there are many more combinations of these. And I am really curious about this experiment because we will see how uh, different species composition in the community can impact uh, further growth of plants. So what I would like you to learn from this presentation is that even though you detect some plant soil feedback for a species, and even though this species is highly abundant, it doesn't mean that it can drive the plant soil feedback of the whole community, because there might be some other stuff going on here. So that's my point, and thank you for your attention.
Okay, time for a couple of quick questions. In front. Um, does Fusticca rubra produce any allelochemicals, uh, so things that might inhibit growth of other plants, or is it just a nutrient thing? Yeah, it does. But uh, I am not able to tell you right now which, which of them, but uh, it is known that it does something like this. Yeah. It's just a general question. I just wondered, if, are you measuring the nutritional quality of your plants? You've measured biomass. I just wondered if you're measuring anything else in terms of plant performance. Yeah, I didn't measure that, but maybe it's a good suggestion because I still have the biomass, so maybe that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> Thanks. Gentleman here. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting presentation, which really was a detective story for me. Um, I was wondering about the field experiment, where you have these small plots of 50 by 50 centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think of these grasses where, the, where you know, above ground you just see this stem, but below ground these roots, they, they tend to go everywhere. Could it not be that, that from the sides of your plots, all these Vestuca roots were still growing into your soil and still having an effect, and therefore you did not see the differences? Uh, well, I think uh, this is not possible because there was uh, quite a huge buffer zone, which was also weeded out. So I think this is not possible because it was half, met uh, half meter of the plot from which the samples were t uh, taken, but it, they were taken from the middle of the plot. And uh, even though there were like 20 <coughs> centimeters of each, uh, on each side, so I think it's quite safe. <laughs> One final question at the back. Thank you for a nice presentation indeed. And it's, it's, I really like the fact that you're using a third, condition, a third phase in your feedback experiment to see the effects of the first conditioning. And it made me think that you, because you've been using two types of soil in that experiment, one was nutrient low and the other one was high in nutrients, perhaps the nutrient limitation indeed gave the effects, that's what you were suggestion, uh, suggesting. Could it also have been the case in your very first experiment, so the, the experiment that you did not find any effects from the uh, Vestuca removal from uh, uh, the field soil, so that there's something limiting in your experiment that the plants are not responding to uh, the, the soil that you took from the field? You did it in a climate room, perhaps light conditions or something that's going on there is limiting the growth of the plants? Well, it's really hard to say. I am definitely going uh, to do some analysis to test this. But uh, I think that uh, the soil shouldn't be so much nutrient limited because I did the first uh, experiment when I was conditioning by Festucarubra and then I found many differences in the uh, plant performance, but they were, uh, this soil was uh, taken from the living uh, community, so there were many species growing in, in it before that. So I would say no, <laughs> but thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right, we're going to change direction slightly now, and uh, Samuel Robinson is going to talk about the spatial distribution of central place foraging pollinators in mass flowering crops. Okay. Hi, everybody. My, uh, my name's Sam Robinson. I'm from uh, the lovely land of Alberta, Canada, uh, where the temperature is today uh, minus, uh, balmy minus 25 degrees, so much nicer to be over here. Um, but I'm going to be talking about uh, a bit about what I've studied in, uh, for the last couple of years um, in oilseed rape systems. Um, but the, the main part of this is going to be, take a bit more of a theoretical bent, uh, so here we go. Uh, so. Uh, the first model that I'd like to talk a bit about is central place foraging. Uh, so central place foraging models, um, or central place foragers, um, represent a special case of foraging where the foragers have to come back to some kind of central location. So for example, you could be a bird that had to return to the nest. Um, and this uh, can cause the, uh, resources to be depleted around the central places because they prioritize near things uh, more than far away things, right? Like, why would I go to a, a coffee shop a mile away when I could go to one right across the road, right? 
Um, so in this model, distance drives choice of patch and resource. Now, the other model uh, I would like to talk about is the ideal free distribution. So the ideal free distribution uh, is a competitive model inherently. Um, and in this, the organisms are ideal and they are free. So they are ideal and they know where the best deal is. They know where they can go to get the, the most food or, or have the most kids or whatever it is. And they are free to choose the best deal. So in other words, they are free to go and occupy those patch or nest sites. Um, and in this model, competition drives the choice of patch and resource. So I've come up with a kind of a small contrived example over here. So uh, I've invented some ideal free grad students. Um, and uh, at a conference, uh, say we have a number of snack tables um, with no various numbers of free snacks. You'd expect that the, uh, an ideal free grad student would move to the table where they could get the best deal, right? So, and that you'd expect this would be approximately one to one. So at the table with a lot of free snacks, you see a lot of ideal free grad students. Okay, now what I'm doing is I'm creating sort of a marriage of these two models. So because both of them have some kind of central flaw in them. Uh, so in, in the central place foraging, uh, the model is incomplete because there's no competition. So most of these, in, in the classical models, it's all based on sort of a single thing um, and uh, going out from a central place. But it doesn't matter, that, that doesn't capture how two central places might compete with each other. You know, if there was a, a bird nest here and a bird nest here, then in, some, in somewhere in the middle, they're going to run into each other and there's going to be, there's going to be a showdown. Um, whereas with the ideal free distribution, it's incomplete because competition, uh, the world has, there's no distance costs. So in other words, it doesn't matter if I'm going to the coffee shop ac across the road or a mile away. Um, it just matters what the lineup is at the coffee shop. So in this, in, in my, in the, the ch this chapter in my thesis, I'm combining these two concepts and then I'm testing them using a real world example. Um, so first off, we should talk about currencies. So uh, currencies are important to these foragers um, and the two that I'm looking at in this particular model are rate and efficiency. Uh, so rate is gains minus costs over time. Um, now for most things that would be something like you'd, you'd measure that in like joules per second if you were a forager. So how many, how much food are you getting per hour? Um, whereas with efficiency, it's profits divided by the costs. So that's how much does it cost me to go out there? Um, it, so that, that's, that's, in, that's incorporated into the model. So that's essentially a, a ratio of your profits to your costs in a given foraging trip. Um, and the behavioral expectations for both of these currencies are actually quite different. So this is a model from uh, Schmidt Hempel et al, uh, who did some work with, with uh, honeybee foraging. Um, and they looked uh, at this, they spaced uh, different, they spaced the flowers uh, differently in these foraging experiments and found that you actually get different results uh, depending on which currency you're, you're optimizing. So they fit an efficiency maximizing model and a rate maximizing model and their data actually fit the efficiency maximizing one quite a bit better. So this just demonstrates that you can get different results depending on which currency the, the organism particularly is optimizing. And then the other thing that I'm interested in is social versus uh, solitary foraging, or, one, uh, or you can put it as um, uh, selfish versus social. So on the left here, we have a species of Andrina, which is a, uh, a solitary bee, so they have no queen. The, uh, their, their entire job for their life, if you will, is to forage for their own benefit, so they don't have to think about what their neighbor is getting. Uh, all they have to do is choose the best deal for themselves. Whereas social foragers, um, in a long-term goal, their long-term goal should be to maximize their colony uh, input. So really, it shouldn't matter to one, whether one forager is getting a good deal. It's just, can I improve the benefit or can I improve the intake to my home colony or home central place? And uh, so my main questions in this are using a simulation model. So how should these aggregations of central place foragers distribute themselves across a homogeneous landscape? So uh, in this case, I'm using, uh, I'm using bees because that's what I study. Um, and then should these differ for rate and efficiency maximizers? And should these differ for social and solitary foragers? And then we can actually put these together and test them using honeybees feeding in canola or what's uh, called over here is oilseed rape. But the, the plant is just Brassica napus. It's the, basically the same thing. So the model here, uh, it has a couple steps for it. So at each step, uh, and for each currency in sociality, 
The first step is to look at the competitive state, so the production rate in that given cell, uh, so say a field of flowers, we can divide it up into cells, like over here, um, and then, uh, then we divide that up evenly among the foragers. Uh, and then you can find the best and worst cells using that. So again, this is assuming they are, they are ideal, so they know where the best deal is. Um, and if movement from the worst cell to the best cell improves the outcome, either for themselves or for their colony, then foragers will move to it. And then this iterates over many steps until we reach an equilibrium distribution. So this is a bit, uh, this is a bit of an example here. So we start at t equals 10. Um, and if we imagine a, a hive or a, a colony of bees in the top left corner here, uh, and then this is a small flowering field, then they will propagate out like this in the model. Um, and then at t equals 1,000, then it reaches fixation, and it, there is no further improvement reached, so this is considered our stable distribution at the end. So this is just an example of how a given model run might propagate over, over the different time steps here. Now the system I'm testing is honeybees foraging in canola. So honeybees are Apis mellifera, um, and we can get physiological data from the literature in order to parameterize this model. So we can get cost of flight. We can get uh, size of their crop, so how much they can, uh, how much they can carry uh, back to their hive. Um, and then we can get, uh, yeah, we can get estimates of how long they stay back in their hive and flight speed. So all of this we can get from literature. And then we also can get uh, canola visitation data, which I gathered uh, myself back in 2014, 2015, and we can get nectar production values from the literature in this, uh, which we've backed up in our, in, our, in our ground, in our field work, and they're basically, they're very similar. So we're, so we're using that. So here's the result from the first set of currencies. So the first set we're gonna talk about is rate maximizing. So rate maximizing, once again, is um, profits divided by the time it takes to get those profits. Um, and then this is the distribution of foragers for three different sizes of colonies. So we use both small, medium, and large uh, based on uh, estimates of what colony sizes would be like uh, early on in the year and then uh, later on in the year. Um, and you can see that they all drop as they go away from the source here. So on the left, that's where the colony is, and then this is the distance from the honeybees uh, going out into this theoretical field of flowers here. And you can see that there's this sharp drop off for all the rate maximizers. And that's because at some point, they reach a point where it's no longer worth it to go any further, and then it goes to zero. So you, that, and that's one of the expectations that you get from rate maximizing foragers, is that you get this, there's this sharp drop off occurring. And it occurs slightly differently for both social and solitary. So uh, for solitary ones, uh, they don't want to compete with each other, so they, they fly slightly further, actually. Now for efficiency maximizing, it looks completely different. Um, this is because they have to optimize their own load size as well as uh, where they're going. Um, and that leads to these completely different expectations here. So you do get a, you get a bit of an upturn at the edge of the field, but then you also get this cutoff going on. So I'll just go back and forth, back between these two, so you can uh, see kind of what the difference is between the efficiency and the rate maximizing. Now you're probably wondering how this matches up to our actual data. Well, here it is. So the, uh, what we actually found out in the field was this black line with, and the confidence intervals are represented by the gray area. And you can see that the rate maximizing model um, utterly fails. So in other words, uh, honeybees are not rate ma maximizers by any stretch of the imagination because it doesn't accurately predict that upturn at the edge of the field. Um, now, so that leaves us with efficiency maximization. And we have both social and solitary here, but solitary is much better in this case. So it appears to, uh, to us that honeybees are, solita are solitary efficiency maximizers um, and because it, clo it most closely matches this distribution in here. So in summary, uh, so they, uh, once again, they appear to maximize individual efficiency. So why is it efficiency? Um, that's it, it in, in, uh, in energetic currencies, um, often we have this discussion about uh, whether it's whether time really matters to these organisms um, and what kind of what kind of time constraints go on during foraging. For instance, uh, does it pay for them to be outside the colony less uh, in order to avoid predation or in order to avoid uh, stress on their wings and that kind of thing? Um, but in this case, it appears that they are just maximizing their their profits divided by their losses. Um, and why are they solitary foragers? I mean, these aren't solitary bees. They live in a colony, so they should be trying to maximize the, the rate of intake for their whole colony, or the efficiency of intake for their whole colony. Um, 
my thought on this is that workers probably in this case are incapable of paying attention to what their nest or their hive mates or what their nest mates are actually up to. So they may it may pay them to be social, but there may be some kind of some kind of constraint in their perception. I mean, they're you know they're they're a centimeter long and they have three neural ganglia, so it's it's not like they could be keeping track of 50,000 other other bees in a single hive. Um, so it may be that this is a perceptual constraint, and that's why that they're doing what they're doing. Um, but yeah, those are kind of some of the theories that we're we're tossing around at this point. And why is this important? Why would we care about this kind of thing? Um, well. For one thing, the realistic competition among central place foragers is not particularly well studied. Most of them have some kind of central assumption about that there's actually very little competition or they use feeding bowls with, with supplies of sugar in it and things like that. Um, but the world doesn't consist of feeding bowls. It, it, it's real landscapes and, and we have real questions to answer here. Um, and we don't have very many tests of these theories in, the, in real world scenarios. And this has implication for pollination practices. So how many uh, hives should a farmer stock their field with if they want equal pollination uh, right out into the middle of the field, for instance? Um, this is particularly important in, in my area because uh, in, uh, in North America, f uh, field sizes can approach uh, 64 hectares is, uh, is a small field uh, where, I, where I work. So this is actually fairly important for this, uh, this kind of work. So thank you to all my, uh, all my, my, the help that I had in the field, and thank you to all my funding sources, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Quick question. You silenced them. Okay. No, oh, oh. <laughs> first one here. <laughs> So if predation risk was an important factor here, which is a very tempting one to think about, mm -hmm. could you put that into your modeling and or could you think of a test, a field test to do to perhaps see if it is having an important effect on the foraging patterns? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's actually been done before. Um, so some people have put forage or have put predation risk in here. Um, in these situations, I don't really have an estimate of what predation is like away from the hive. Um, and what most people in these models do is they just kind of assume equal predation everywhere. So it's just, uh, you know, the longer you stay outside the hive, the more likely you are to be eaten by a bird or something like that. Um, and if you do that, it generally tends to prioritize, they, they tend to prioritize things that are closer to the hive because that's less of a round trip for them to expose themselves. Um, so that, that is one expectation that comes out of a predation risk uh, currency, if that's included in there. Not sure, I'm more, more a modeler, so I'm questions about the model. It was two dimensional, I guess? The uh, the no, actually, well, here, I'll, I'll go okay. back and, I'll go back yeah, and show. So, uh, so the actual model was run, was run in, in two dimensions yeah. like this, okay. but the line I took from the main diagonal. Yes. So, uh, so, so okay. the, uh, but the, the result, and, and the results you compare with are also two dimensional. Yep, but this is just this is yeah. uh, this is yeah, the the, this the is cells the, from the main diagonal on there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But in two dimensions, they fit, they also fit like the distribution is symmetric like this. The yes, end. as far as I can tell, they're symmetrical. Yeah, okay. I mean it, it depends on what <laughs> cell size you use as well. Like if you if you use hundred meter cells, then you might get weird asymmetries. But if you use small enough cells, then they should be symmetrical. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, our next presentation is uh, Alan Van Belton explaining antiphase predator prey cycles. Alan. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I am Ellen and I uh, work at the University of Potsdam and there I work uh, as a part of a larger project that is called Dynatrate. And in this project we work on uh, the impact of the dynamics of traits, as the name would suggest, and the impact of that on ecological dynamics. So uh, the subject that we are working on and what I am working on is uh, eco-evolutionary dynamics. 
And when we talk about eco-evolutionary dynamics, this is one of the most famous examples of this. So if we have a predator-prey system with one predator, one prey, and we have no adaptation in this at all, then we expect the kind of dynamics that you see on the left here, where the predator lags behind the prey always with a quarter of the period of the cycle. But uh, if the prey can adapt rapidly, to the presence of the predators uh, and can change its level of defense, then this dynamic can change into these very distinctive antiphase cycles. And this is so distinctive, so striking, that this has been called a smoking gun for rapid evolution. So in other words, if you want to look at predator-prey predator systems and see if rapid evolution is taking place, you should be looking for these kinds of dynamics. Um, but with that said, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot that we still don't really know about these antiphase cycles. And one of the biggest problems there is that almost all of the experiments on this have focused on very simplified systems where only the prey can adapt, which, as you can imagine, is not necessarily the most realistic scenario. Um, but if you add adaptation in the predator to this, of course, this, uh, the scenario becomes a lot more complex and more difficult to study. Um, Unfortunately, it's also more realistic, but we don't really know what happens and if this prediction of the antiphase cycles being a smoking gun would even hold up in this case. Uh, we do have a couple of models that are studying what happens uh, very theoretically, but uh, they give often contradictory predictions. And because also they are so complex and because the dynamics are so complex, it's very difficult to look at them and really disentangle why it is that they give different predictions. And so we don't really know what's what. And well, this is the thing that I've been working on. So can we find a way to disentangle the complex model results from this and extract from this uh, some general fundamental principles on what underlies the predator-prey dynamics? And with this, answer these two questions. So first of all, when does mutual adaptation result in antiphase cycles? And secondly, much more importantly, why? So uh, for this, we used a basic model. So the model itself is not new. This is all based on what other people have done, but just the way that we looked at what happens in the model is different. So we have a prey and we have a predator, and they are described, the dynamics are described by these differential equations. They are fairly straightforward. And uh, both the prey and the predator have uh, a trait that can change over time. So the prey has a level of defense, and the predator has a level of offense. And together, these two traits determine the level of predation that is going on. So that's expressed by the attack rate, which is a function of these two traits. So basically, if the offense is higher than the defense, then the attack rate is high. And if the defense is higher than the offense, then the attack rate is low. Uh, so for both the prey and the predator, there is a strong benefit for investing more in a high trade value. But of course, this also comes at a cost. So for the prey, we are assuming that the the cost is expressed as uh, a reduction in the intrinsic growth rate, as is shown in this figure here. And for the predator, we assume a similar trade-off, but for the conversion efficiency. And uh, with that, we can now also describe the dynamics of the two traits uh, as differential equations. So in total, we have a system of four differential equations. And um, so we take a fitness gradient approach here. So we assume that the, the trait is following uh, is always evolving in the direction that will increase uh, the per capita growth rate, which mimics uh, selection. And these two parameters here, uh, the gx and gy, they denote uh, they are a measure for uh, the speed of adaptation. So gx is the speed of adaptation of the prey, gy in the predator. And uh, these are the parameters that I'm going to show uh, some results for. So. Uh, well, first, let's look at the dynamics. So if we uh, run this model for different parameter values, then we get, uh, for a large part of the parameter space, we get predator-prey cycles, and they can be roughly subdivided into these two types. So there are the antiphase cycles at the top, and at the bottom, uh, we get the quarter lag cycles that are exactly the same as we would expect to see in a model without evolution. And if we look at the parameter ranges for which we find these, uh, the colors are a bit off, but the green colors that are shown here, okay, on the x-axis we have the speed of adaptation in the predator with uh, slow adaptation on the left and fast adaptation on the right. And on the y-axis we have the speed of adaptation in the prey and the colors denote uh, the phase relationship. 
So in the legend on the right, you can see the phase relationship. So the green colors have a phase lag of 0.5. So these are anti-phase cycles. And uh, these are always found when the speed of adaptation in the predator is slow. And this is true regardless of the speed of adaptation in the prey. And uh, if the speed of adaptation in the predator is fast, then uh, we get the orange colors. So those are the quarter lag cycles. So that's our first result. So this um, smoking gun for rapid evolution, ironically, does not quite hold up when both species can adapt rapidly. Uh, but this is not the interesting part. Now, the interesting part is to figure out why we see this pattern. And uh, for this, the first step in understanding this is to realize that the predator growth in any predator-prey model uh, is limited by the prey availability. But the prey availability is not just the prey numbers, but it also contains such things as how likely it is that the predator will actually catch the prey, and how high the quality of the, uh, of the prey is to the predator, and basically what does the predator get out of each prey. So <clears throat> in our model, we uh, developed a measure for uh, the prey availability that we call the effective prey biomass. And this consists of three, uh, three things. So the actual prey biomass, and uh, the second one is uh, the vulnerability of the prey to predation. So this is the attack rate. And uh, finally, uh, the quality of the prey to the predator uh, is the conversion efficiency. So we have these three items. We, we multiply these three together, then we get a measure for the effective prey biomass. And uh, well, this is the result that I showed before. So this is the predator-prey phase relationship. Now, if we do this analysis again, but for the effective prey rather than for the actual prey, we get exactly the result that we would expect, right? So we always find the predator following the effective prey with a quarter lag, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so from this, it follows that uh, the predator-prey phase relationship is determined by the phase relationship between the prey and the effective prey. So if the effective prey dynamics are delayed, with respect to the actual prey, you might get anti-phase cycles or something close to it. So <clears throat> let's take a closer look at this. So these are the ecological dynamics that I just showed before. And uh, here are the corresponding trait dynamics. And, <clears throat> and uh, the trait dynamics together with the prey biomass dynamics uh, together determine the dynamics of the uh, effective prey biomass, which looks like this. So, uh, yeah, now we can actually see what is going on. So let's uh, look at the antiphase cycles first. Um, here we have the increase in the prey biomass. Now, if we look at the trade dynamics that are going on at the same time, we see that uh, here the defense also strongly increases together with the prey biomass. So that if you look at the effective prey biomass, even though the actual prey biomass goes up, the effective prey biomass actually goes down. So uh, the peak in the actual prey biomass is not translated in a peak into a peak in the effective prey biomass, which falls here, which is not at all when the prey biomass itself is at its peak, but long after it already has started to go down. Uh, so the peak in the effective prey biomass is delayed with respect to the peak in the actual prey biomass, and from that follows that the peak in the predator is also delayed. And if you contrast this with what happens if you have quarter lag cycles, so here again is the increase in the prey. And now we see that as the prey increases, the defense actually decreases. So the prey becomes more abundant and it also becomes less defended. So the effective prey biomass does not just go up, but it goes up a lot. Uh, and more importantly, we get the peak uh, in the effective prey biomass at exactly the same point as the peak in the actual prey biomass. So the predator-prey dynamics show this basic quarter lag cycle that we also would have seen if there were no adaptation at all. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so we did a lot of analysis, but this was basically the result that we always got out of it. Uh, the phase relationship between the predator and the prey in the end is determined by whether the prey biomass and the defense cycle in sync or out of sync. And we then compared this to experimental data, and then we compared this to the results of other models, and this result always holds up. So uh, this was always the underlying mechanism for it. Um, 
it's just that nobody else thought to look at it this way before. So now we have almost the entire story, right? So now we know what causes antiphase cycles, but now the last piece of the puzzle is uh, when do we expect prey biomass and defense to cycle in sync, and when do we uh, expect them to cycle out of sync? And uh, for this, we should remember that uh, defense always comes at, uh, is associated with a trade-off. So there is a strong benefit, which is uh, reduced predation, but there's also a cost, so it's slower growth. Uh, in our model, at least, we modeled this as slower growth. You can assume other things. Uh, so this is the condition that I showed for antiphase cycles. If defense goes up, the prey biomass must also go up. So this means that uh, if defense goes up, it releases the prey from predation, which allows it to suddenly start growing. So uh, we expect this to happen if the benefits of defense are much more pronounced than the costs of defense. And uh, conversely, if, uh, if you find quartz lag cycles, then if defense goes down, then the prey biomass goes up. So in this case, uh, if the defense goes down, the costs of defense suddenly are lowered significantly, which allows the prey biomass to grow. So in this case, the peak in the prey biomass is caused by a release from the costs and not by a release from defense, which is uh, expected to happen when the costs are much more pronounced than the benefits. So with this, uh, yeah, I'd like to summarize my results. Uh, yeah, the first two are my main results, but I would like to draw your attention to uh, number three. Uh, the speed of predator adaptation may be a stronger predictor for the predator-prey phase relationship than the speed of prey adaptation, which, given the fact that uh, most of the models and experiments have been done only on prey adaptation and have left out the predator entirely, um, I think that the time is long past that we start looking at uh, adaptation on all trophic levels uh, together. So uh, I would like to thank some people and thank you all for listening. Yeah. So, <coughs> so you find that when um, predator defense, uh, predator offense uh, evolves rapidly, you get these yeah. regular-ish quarter lag cycles. Um, but you also show just in these that there's um, very rapid crashes because they're essentially able to eat everything almost. Um, if okay, you translate so? this model from a... Um, an ODE to like a stochastic ODE, and so you can have <laughs> extinction then. Do, do, uh, do these results in, still hold? Uh, in, in which case, uh, t to which one are you referring? The, the, uh, the right-hand on panel? The, 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 yeah, okay, so the upper panel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the top panel of the dynamics, you get uh, very close to just eradication. Yeah, well, it, it's not, it's not that this, close is this to common eradication, across things but... Or? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in this case, it's not even that pronounced, but you do see yeah. that if you drive the speed of adaptation up very high, then the predator biomass especially becomes very, very low. So um, stochastically, I definitely would expect to see extinctions there. It's that's also interesting in itself. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. One very quick question. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Um, so I guess my question is this effect of uh, population size of the prey, um, mm -hmm. is, is that, are you visualizing that as being sort of a density dependent function? Is this uh, simply because the prey uh, essentially consume all their resources and are therefore more vulnerable? Uh, I am sorry. Uh, could, could, could you repeat that? I'm not sure that yeah. I um, so the, um, uh, maybe I misunderstood the effect of uh, population yeah. size of the prey, but I, the way that I was visualizing it, it was, this, is, this is the population that's actually available to the predator. Yes. Um, and is that a function of density dependence, such that, uh, such that the larger the population of prey, uh, the more the resources they're consuming, um, and the more prone they are to starvation, and therefore uh, more vulnerable to predation. That's an interesting thought, but no, we don't have any such uh, effects in our model, no. So uh, in this case, it's entirely uh, due to the trade dynamics. So if you look at, well, I'd, I could also uh, show a different graph, but if you just look at 
the, uh, the places where the offense is much higher than the defense, then you see that there the effective prey biomass is relatively high and yeah. But no, I didn't have any such. Well, presumably Thank those you. things could be built into a future model. Yeah, it, it's definitely an interesting thought. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Our next speaker is Sergio Timoteo, who will speak on seed dispersal networks spanning across the landscape of Gar Garangosa National Park. A spatial multi-layer network approach. <coughs> Sergio. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon all. So um, I come from uh, the University of Coimbra uh, and we did uh, some work in uh, Gorongosa National Park in, in Mozambique and in this one we focused on uh, sea dispersal and we tried to use this uh, multi-layer network approach. Um, as you know, as we know, um, most ecosystem fun uh, functions rely on the interaction between uh, the different species. Uh, they uh, do seed dispersal, I know animals disperse seeds, uh, I know insects pollinate, that's uh, the composition, and they form uh, a network of interactions. And uh, during the, the 80s mostly, uh, network theory um, was brought into the field of um, uh, ecology to help to visual, visualize and understand the patterns of interactions between um, the, the species and what the, the different structures of the networks would mean to um, I know, stability of the systems and, uh, I know, uh, and to the functioning of the, the ecosystems. And people have used uh, several different metrics uh, describing the importance of um, the different species, uh, looking at uh, different patterns like nestedness or modularity, uh, and looking at specialization of the different species and the whole network um, as a whole. Uh, however, mo most, of the, most of the works have uh, dealt with these networks as kind of um, discrete entities, so comparing different time steps or like different habitats in a kind of separate way, so things were kind of a bit closed and looking at different uh, interactions but in a kind of a separate way and then comparing the different uh, kind of metrics or variables that you would extract from those um, I know, individual networks. Uh, however, most, I know, most, not of most of the things, but everything is kind of connected. Things are uh, connected in space and in time and the, by the, the common species and common interactions and all, uh, and the different species also participate in different um, uh, networks, so different types of, some, some animals might uh, disperse seeds but at the same time uh, perform pollination and so on. And so, I know we kind of should use uh, a more kind of holistic or multi-level um, framework to analyze this considering this um, connections between the different uh, types of networks and uh, in, in time and space uh, and so on. And, that's, uh, and so recently people have been trying to use uh, a multi-layer approach uh, to connect all these, uh, all these things. Uh, so the work um, we did was in, uh, in Gorongosa National Park, which is in uh, Mozambique in Africa. This um, um, a 4,000 square kilometers park <clears throat> that is characterized by a, a wet uh, season and a dry season. Um, the habitat, the landscape is quite influenced by uh, a, a flooding that occurs during, the, uh, during and after the, uh, the wet season. And there's like a Lake Rayma, which is at the center of the park that expands hugely. And this creates different types of, uh, I know, uh, leads to different types of uh, soils with different characteristics and then different types of forests uh, and habitats. Um, this park was an iconic park during the 60s and the 70s because of its um, diverse wildlife and uh, high number of and the high density of animals. Uh, unfortunately, during the, after the independence of Mozambique, there was a civil war, the park was abandoned and closed. I know animals were killed and poached for ivory, uh, meat. I know, I know all the big animals just pretty much almost disappeared. 
um, until until like 2004, the government of Mozambique uh, and the Great Park Foundation established a, a protocol to recover the park, and since then they've been working uh, on bringing back another um, the park and the wildlife in the park to I know what it was I know in the old times and can attract people again. Um, and this uh, huge decrease in the number of, anim uh, of animals, you can see the numbers over there, these, the most iconic ones, um, certainly led, uh, I know, um, at the consequence of I know, changing patterns of, um, um, of the functioning of the ecosystem, that's probably, there were like changes in the structure of the vegetation and in the different um, habitats, uh, and possibly, uh, the sea dispersal service performed by these animals uh, was hugely affected because they weren't there to do what they were doing before. Um, and sea dispersal, as I know, um, is quite a, an important stage as, um, of the uh, plant life cycle, uh, determining the, the spatial distribution of, of plants so they can escape interspecific competition, avoid predation near the uh, I know, parental plants, reach new. Uh, available um, habitats, and then you know, uh, the uh, if less the spatial and the genetic structure of the of these populations. So, okay, we went there, and we wanted to look at um, a sea dispersal at the at the landscape level in in Gorongosa. and our uh, two main objectives were to evaluate the spatial fidelity of sea dispersal uh, communities. Uh, and identifying these, these communi communities through using a uh, multi-layer modularity uh, approach and then assess the importance of the individual species as spatial couplers uh, of the different habitats and we used a measure of importance uh, that is uh, versatility. Um, so to calculate modularity is basically, basically measures, um, I know, Aside from identifying the different communities, it measures, gives you a measure of, um, uh, gives you groups of, of species that interact more frequently than they, I know, that would be expected by just by, uh, by, by chance. And we used like, uh, we used a generalized Lovian method, which goes in two steps. First, I know, um, each node is assigned to a, diff to a, to a community. And then, I know, uh, calculates modularity when it reaches a maximum. Then, you know, these communities are used as uh, the nodes for uh, a, new net, a new network. And then it's calculated again until you find a, uh, I know, a, a new value of uh, modularity. Um, and then you have your, uh, you'll have your uh, communities. Uh, to, to assess species importance, we use we use uh, versatility, which is a cent centrality measure that um, gives you a, 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 a val uh, an, the importance of each node on the network, and this is uh, based on uh, page rank, um, which is based on the, uh, a walk beti between nodes, and in this case of multi-layer networks, it allows the, the walk then to jump from uh, layer to layer. And the importance of the nodes is in the end, the sum of the importance of the, uh, the neighbor uh, nodes. So then, um, so we had our four habitats, the grassland, transition forest, uh, mixed dry forest, and uh, Miombu um, woodlands. We sampled uh, during one year, we did 12 rounds. We used transex, mist netting, camera traps, and all to get, to maximize the number of uh, interactions that we uh, would get uh, for our network. We did, I know, uh, we sorted seeds from uh, our samples. We then identified things through a reference collection and when we couldn't do through a reference collection, we used uh, barcoding and we put everything in a matrix and we got our um, I know, network for, uh, for Gorongos. So we had 32 animals dispersing 101 uh, species of plants, and these, uh, all these in 608 uh, interactions. You see, we have a range of different animals from birds, I know, elephants, primates, antelopes, 
um, insects, different colors, uh, say different uh, animals. The most important animals uh, in this system were the baboons, elephants, and civets uh, that did most, uh, most of the, the, the sea dispersal. And then this is split by the different, uh, the different habitats. Um, so we have more animals and more plants in the mixed dry forest and, that, and less animals and plants in Miyombu and the same kind of holds for uh, interaction richness. is more rich in uh, the mixed dry forest than uh, in the, the Miyombu uh, woodlands. Then when we had uh, our uh, calculated run modularity, we found our, uh, seed com the community of seed dispersers. We see each color uh, uh, indicates a different community of seed dispersers. So you have communities with all kinds of uh, animals. That's kind of a, um, a big diversity even uh, within each um, of the communities. And um, so we found 13 communities um, the, the mixed dry forest had most of the communities, 12. Then we had transition forest and grassland with a few less uh, communities, and then Miombu. And most of the communities, uh, around eight of the communities, uh, was, were present in at least three of the, of the habitats. Uh, looking at simil similarities between the habitats, you know, there was like a, a very low uh, edge overlap, so the number of leaks shared by all the habitats was quite low. And then if you look at the different habitats, the mixed dry forest and the transition forest are quite uh, similar. And then Miombo and Crestlands are quite uh, different in terms of shared interactions. If we look at uh, the shared herb species, the herb species are the ones that have a higher degree, so they, they were dispersing um, uh, more species in the different habitats. So, oops, there was a bit of a, a problem with formatting, but, but basically the, the same pattern holds. So mixed uh, dry forest and transition forests are more similar than Miombo, and, and then Miombo and the grasslands are quite diverging in terms of um, uh, the share uh, of herb species. Uh, then we went to the, I know, look at the, the sea dispersers by, uh, by themselves. We didn't find any uh, differences between uh, gen generally uh, the, the degree of the species between the different habitats and the mean specialization in each of the habitats. Uh, and then we, we looked at uh, versatility that gives you the importance of each um, of each of the species. So we can see that uh, he, over here, baboons and elephants were uh, quite important uh, for the sea dispersal across the whole landscape, uh, across, uh, across the different um, habitats. And, but then there were like a, a couple of other important species like the civets over here and um, porcupine and also reed buck and also, um, yeah, uh, those are the most important. And we tried to, to see if there was any relationship or correlation between the importance of the species and their specialization. It seems there's like a kind of a inverse relationship where as versatility goes down, the specialization goes up. So, um, so to finish, so um, the seed dispersal network of Gorongos is highly modular. There's uh, quite diverse communities with different animals of from uh, present and communities and most of the communities have a, a low special fidelity, so they will provide special continuity to sea dispersal across the landscape. Uh, there was a, a few versatile species that dominate the network, namely the baboons, the elephants, and the civets. These act as, spe as special uh, couplers, uh, providing connectivity to habitats and landscapes. And these species tend to conserve the topological roles across the, uh, the habitat. So they provide local and global cohesion to the network and potentially stabilize the, the sea dispersal network. So for conservation and restoration, um, uh, and restoration so we need to integrate the view of species and, uh, and the interactions they have uh, established uh, among them. And, and then we brought network theory to the field of ecology. But then we need to consider special, temporal, and functional heterogeneity. 
And for this, we I know, should think about moving uh, into multi-layer networks. So to finish, I just want to thank my team um, and funding uh, from, uh, from the Portuguese government and logistic support from uh, the Grongosa Park and Greg Carr Foundation. And that's it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have one quick question? Oh, two quick questions. Yeah, we um, we were quite surprised that um, I know we didn't get birds as <coughs> as much as we were expecting. You I know you mentioned and the literature mentions that um, uh, that that they are quite important. Um, I think one one thing I know I uh, mostly used uh, I, I miss net, uh, and I think one of the things is uh, I know the canopy is quite high, and I might have missed I know quite some birds, some species that just would go over the, over the nets and that might influence uh, I know, the importance that the, the birds have in this network. Uh, but yeah. Hi, thanks, that was a great talk. Um, very similar question, I'm just wondering whether many species are wind dispersed or water dispersed rather than by animal vectors in this system? Um, <clears throat> I think there's quite a lot of um, stuff that is uh, water dispersed. We, we were looking at dispersal. Uh, probably I didn't mention that, but just animal media. Yeah, really yeah. <laughs> uh, just to make sure I mentioned yeah. that. Um, yeah, the, I, I think there's quite a lot of stuff that is moving around with water because the, the, the Lake Rim at the center, I know it goes from kind of 10 square kilometers uh, at the peak of the dry season to I think 200 square kilometers. So there's lots of stuff, uh, I know, moving in the water. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is definitely the graveyard slot. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about developing an ecofusion framework for novel ecosystems and hybrid ecologies. Um, there's information on the back table uh, relating to this, and it's based on a, a book that I've got coming out later this month. And it's really in a context of looking at issues of native and alien species, taking a UK group GB case study, but you know, very major issues around the world, linked to environmental change, climate change, and also potentially ideas of uh, rewilding and wilder future landscapes. Invasive, particularly alien species, raise all sorts of issues. Um, massive things uh, in terms of debates in the UK, uh, potentially enormous costs, Around the world, invasive species cause economies to collapse, they cause people to starve, they have huge disruptive impacts on uh, ecosystems. That's a picture of giant hogweed, which I grow in my garden, uh, and I do a party trick sometimes in the summer because I have a scar all the way up my arm, and if I get it in sunlight, it all comes out. It's quite interesting. Um, it's a nasty alien species, but it's a fantastic garden plant. <coughs> Increasingly, there's a need to provide integrated solutions to the challenges of these invasives. There's Himalayan balsam there, and you know, particularly in the context of Brexit, we have Spanish bluebell now diluting our native bluebell populations, and people get terribly upset about this. Um, we need to understand invasion biology. Um, this is critical to any meaningful response to these undoubted issues. However, I would argue that the ecological effects of merging native and alien uh, species to form novel communities are rarely discussed. If you actually look at 
the biodiversity in a country like the UK uh, or Great Britain, the actual biomass of non-native birds in the avifauna is a colossal proportion of our present avifauna. They're having a huge impact, and they are going to have a huge impact, and they will continue to have a huge impact into the future. And the other point is that if we actually look at the, uh, the perception of these things, actually most of the public like them. Things like the ring neck parakeet, when you get these coming to your garden, wow, it's amazing in London, you can't move for them. I have to say, when you get 500 coming into your garden, and they are very, very noisy, then people maybe change their, different, their views. There's been a lot of work done in North America and Australasia, um, particularly recent book by Hobbes, um, and work spanning really the last 10 or 15 years or so. Um, dealing with novel ecosystems and hybrid ecologies. And they look at things like historical systems, to use systems, to novel ecologies, biotic and abiotic novelty, impacts of climate change and invasions, and then classic restoration and restored landscapes and development and land use change, abandonment and release. So we can start to conceptualise a whole set of uh, trends. <coughs> and... They've got you know, these ideas of novelty, so we can have wild historical landscapes, and, uh, intensive agricultural, we can have processes of degradation and invasion, of abandonment, and we can examine the degree of novelty in these ecosystems. And yet these have not really been discussed or debated in the European context or the UK context to any great extent. There was some work done by Barker um, around about 2000, um, but since then, there's been little done on that. So what I've tried to do is to place concepts of novel ecosystems into a wider framework created for hybrid ecologies based on concepts of ecological fusion processes. And we start to come up with um, different ideas of linking novelty, hybrid systems, and historical ecosystems, and the various uh, drivers of this, and the, the degree to which these are um, reversible or not. And when you come to the ideas of uh, novel ecosystems, the idea is that these actually will not be returned to a baseline condition, or certainly not very, very easily. There are problems in the UK, and I don't think all these things actually transfer desperately easily. Um, ecological fusion, or ecofusion as I describe it, generally it's novelty in ecosystems. And the other thing is that this process is not new. There are abundant historic precedents for hybrid systems. And we can look at the historical, wild, degree of novelty, human dominated. And we can look at the things which are actually um, involved in this. Trophic complexity, aerial carbon dioxide, nitrogen deposition, composition, biotic, abiotic um, drivers. And a lot of these things have actually been happening for a long, long time. And if you look at uh, in Europe, and certainly in the UK GB, history shows us that ever since the Celts, and probably before, we've had hybrid systems. It's just that the rate of change is increasing very rapidly at the moment. But history suggests that you know, major keystone species are non-natives. They are parts of these hybrid ecologies. And that with the way that the planet is changing, the way the climate is changing, other environmental change, um, future ecologies will increasingly be hybrid. There's a little plan here, I don't want you to go through it in detail, but basically this was just trying to actually put um, a, an historic context into the process of ecofusion and hybridization and recombination. And we can see uh, native species extinctions, we can see displacement integration, we can see recombinant ecologies, land use change, exotic and alien species introductions, plus invasions by native species. And we can take this from the Celts right the way down through to the modern phase of uh, globalization. It's happening, it's been happening. Um, we have to actually address some of the issues that uh, stem from this. At the same time, nature conservation faces huge challenges. Um, and I think everyone agrees that for any hope of success in conservation, we need bold views of bigger, wilder future and more uh, joined landscapes. However, this must accommodate the inevitable changes, no matter how unpalatable they seem. 
we are going to be in a situation of eco-fusion. We've been in a situation of eco-fusion. It's just getting more and more. We've got human influences. We've got environmental influences bringing together native and alien species into recombinant ecologies. So we're forging new ecological systems, intimate mixes of native and exotic species, and these are and will deliver ecosystem services and functions, as well as disruption. Uh, we can see this uh, ecological fusion generating hybrid ecology much as in the past. And we have processes of uh, arrival and invasion, establishment, hybridization and fusion, recombinant ecology, uh, and we can start to predict future trends. Humanity triggered many drivers of such changes. It also has the potential to create the templates on which nature can reconfigure a baseline condition. So there's a summary framework there which takes you from historical wild nature, natural ecologies through semi-natural eco-cultural to hybrid recombinant ecologies and maybe to novel ecologies. Uh, and we see the eco-fusion processes, recombination and hybridization. And we can look at this both in urban and rural. There's a lot of attention being placed on urban landscapes, but these things are happening in the rural landscapes as well. Some take-home messages and some key issues. Um, wider, concept, wider concepts and ideas of novel ecologies don't necessarily find an easy fit in the GB or UK. One reason for that uh, is that we're often faced with essentially habitat patches rather than intact functioning ecosystems. Particularly if you go into uh, lowland England, into a farming landscape, and look around you, there's very little actually uh, functioning native um, natural ecosystem. Basic ecological processes and parameters still apply to hybrid systems, and I know uh, I've had dialogue with Philip Grime and his colleagues at Sheffield University, and what they say about invaders and about these processes is that the same rules apply. They, the rules that you can apply to um, a native or natural system apply to these hybrid systems. Ecofusion and recombination will become ever more significant. It is the way that things are going. Climate change, environmental change, globalization, they're all moving us in one direction. We have to make decisions about that. Against that, I would suggest that there's a long history of ecofusion, and certainly somewhere like the UK, we can actually see that stemming back over thousands of years. Global changes now driving current and future recombination. Many changes are predictable, and you can use the approach of different uh, people like Philip Grime uh, and his strategy theories and ideas of that. You can actually predict what's going to happen. You can look at successional theories, etc. Many of the changes are uh, inevitable. Hybrid ecologies may also deliver ecosystem services in the base change baseline condition. I don't know that uh, Hobbes and some of the others, in looking at their novel ecosystems, have been looking at um, how these species work in that situation. We're at the same time looking, say in the UK, at the implications of climate change on how native species may or may not survive in a changed environment. Um, and it may be that hybridization is uh, a part of that process. At the same time, if you look in detail, hybridization occurs at both the species level. Uh, so you get, say, in the UK, we get red deer, seeker deer hybrids. We get quite a number of plant species hybrids. We get um, you know, a whole range of species where you're not dealing with a pure genetic uh, type again at the moment and it goes right away to to community level and ecosystem level so we're getting uh, hybridization from species right the way up to the the higher levels there may be more resilience to change and again philip grimes work has predicted this the, the more resilience to change in the unimproved oligotrophic often upland zones where the systems are less productive and the changes are slower, but they are still changing. Um, and as I say, we can look at these uh, changes, we can look at these patterns as predicted by ecological strategy theory. So that's a very rapid run through, and I have to keep to time as I'm chairing. So thank you very much. We may have time for one quick question.
thanks very much for that, Ian. That was really interesting. It made me really pleased that I ran into you at lunchtime yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, I might not have been here. Um, I, I think um, the nervousness that ecologists and conservationists have is very real, and I certainly have it. Um, but what you've outlined here just really echoes what's been going through my head a lot recently. And um, Ted Green, Keith Alexander did a piece in British Wildlife recently about uh, you know, our, our lack of acceptance of trees such as uh, sycamore and sweet chestnut, which are really good for a suite of species and have been here a long time. Um, uh, but, but for me, I start questioning where, where do I draw the line? I, I, I work for Natural England, uh, for anyone who doesn't know me in the room. Uh, so I, I would say that in, a, in the legal framework, there's a lot to get around uh, in terms that our, our nature reserves are designated for native species, and that's really difficult to overcome. Uh, and in my head, wh you know, where do I draw the line? Do I start thinking, well, Sitka spruce with an understory of hemlock and rhododendron is going to be great in the future, uh, so you know, let's, <laughs> let's let it go now. Uh, so lots of yeah. questions, but really interesting um, thinking. It I raises, don't really have yeah. a specific question. Uh, but, yeah, thank um, you. I mean, it, it does raise some, some very serious issues. And I, I wouldn't um, in any way denigrate the, the need to conserve the native species which are under threat. I think we have to do that in the full awareness of these changes which are happening. And also as an environmental historian, I mean, I, d I did a book, which hopefully some of you have read with Rob Lambert a few years ago, on which covered things like perceptions of alien and native. And as an environmental historian, sometimes we've actually got the science wrong. Some of these things are labelled as uh, alien and they're not, and some of them are labelled as native and they're not. I mean, iconic species in Britain, the brown hare, the rabbit, keystone species, the fallow deer. These are all non-natives. And also the process involves the loss of keystone species, like the beaver, the wild boar, and the predators. So we've got a really muddled system and it's trying to get to grips with that in the consequence of all the global changes that are happening as well. And it raises, I think, a lot of challenges. There's more information on the back of the book is out later this month. So. Um, yeah, it's just a thought that um, in some senses what you're proposing or what you're painting is a more hopeful picture than many of what many of the sort of perceptions that we have of the future. Um, but I think one of the big trends as soon as you've got globalization is biotic homogenization. Um, and I wondered how you felt that played, because it almost feels like, yeah, there's the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it, it is a, it's a question that comes up again and again. Um, and there's no, there's no easy answer. Um, and to some extent, this is why I, I'm not sure that the idea of novel ecosystems as such easily fits with what we're witnessing in the UK. Um, for them to be novel ecosystems, they really have to be replicable in different situations, and they have to be um, either moving in one way and certainly not going backwards. They have to be dis distinctive, they have to be definable. Uh, at the moment, we're not, I don't think we're really sure what we're going to come out with. Uh, and how similar things may be that happen in the UK to something that happens maybe in a different part of Europe. I think they're going to be very influenced by um, climatic trends across regions. I think some of these changes have always been happening and that we kind of now we're more, you know, we're more aware of them. There's some really interesting stuff that was done. I mean, I, I did my PhD years ago on rhododendron invasion, and there's some very interesting stuff that's been done by... Uh, colleagues at St Andrews, I think it was, looking at the genetics. And it turns out that the rhododendron introduced to Britain was deliberately hybridizing cultivation with American Cotorbiensia maximum, and that within the environment when it's escaping, you're getting a selection for the genes of frost tolerance in areas which are colder, and you're getting different... So you're actually getting a, a, a separation within the species that's spreading invasively across Britain, and they're actually adapting better to different environments in different areas. You know, so there's all these things actually playing out. Um, it's going to happen. It doesn't mean that we should give up on conserving the natives, but I think we need to maybe l be more accepting of some of the changes that are going to happen. When I, I look at things like... Um, 
there's quite a few invasive higher plant species, like, say, sweet Sicily, which are spreading just as rapidly as things like Himalayan balsam in many cases. But we like one because it came in maybe medieval times and we've kind of accepted it. And we don't like the other one purely because we don't like it. And yet the public are out there spreading it. So I know I've got people whose whole lives, I do a lot of uh, community stuff, and I've got people whose whole lives are devoted to spreading Himalayan balsam around Europe. And they say, yeah, we know about it all, but we love it. Now, you know, we have to build that into the models because it's, it's happening. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. And thank you again to our presenters.